Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, wherever you, you might uh, be, this is the uh, St. Patrick's Day here in the United States, where uh, the uh, roughly 40 million Americans of Irish ancestry uh, are going to be celebrating for the next 24 hours, <clears throat> some longer than that. <clears throat> We're four days away from uh, no rules. Uh, in Iran, uh, New Year, and we're just barely two weeks before Ramadan uh, begins in Oman and throughout the Islamic world with its 200 billion uh, adherents to the Islamic uh, faith. <clears throat> My name is uh, John Duke Anthony. I'm the president, founding president and CEO of the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations. We were established in 1983 is a non-governmental, non-profit organization based in Washington, D.C. And we have uh, alumni, volunteers, and affiliates throughout all 50 of the United uh, States at the national, uh, state, and uh, local level. We're having today's program solely on Oman and what Oman is, what it has, and why uh, you would want to put it on your list of things to do before life passes uh, much longer. And actually, we're doing this on popular demand. We did one before, uh, back uh, almost uh, a year ago, three quarters of a year ago, and the response was so positive and word got around from people who missed it. Uh, could we do something like this again and take it to a higher level and, and focus on uh, some of the similar themes and constants and variables and topics, but also introduce some new ones? because in the last year, there've been some path-breaking, groundbreaking uh, developments occurring uh, in Oman, which will be uh, revealed as this program uh, proceeds. <clears throat> My relationship with Oman goes back to 1971. Uh, I have been to Oman 53 times. It's uh, almost like going to a university from which there's no possible graduation, <clears throat> only on the best of occasions, uh, and incomplete. Uh, but Americans have been going to Oman uh, far longer. In the late 18th century, in the late 1700s, uh, America's uh, whaling fleets and maritime adventurers uh, made their way all the way uh, to Oman. This was before the Suez Canal uh, was built in uh, 1869, so they had to go around the Southern African Cape of, of Good Hope. And Beyond that, Oman was a regional power, verging on a Indo-Pacific uh, Ocean uh, uh, global power. Indeed, from the uh, in the 1400s, of all of the business people in China, and Omani was rep elected to represent them uh, to the Chinese uh, authorities. So the Omanis have been on the world stage even before. Uh, the United States became a player uh, in and of itself. So much so was Oman uh, recognized and, uh, and deemed important that in 1833, the United States negotiated a treaty of commerce and friendship uh, with uh, Oman. It was known as the Roberts Treaty because he was the American consular official who negotiated uh, the agreement. And then on top of that, uh, Oman uh, was the first Arab country to post an ambassador to the United States uh, up in Oman, al qaeda who came to New York in uh, uh, 1840. And uh, this was a sensation with regard to those who are into research and scholarly exports and pursuits. You can find out what the city of New York, the media of New York, the society, the elite of New York, regarded that visit by the Omani ambassador to the United States. And it also occasioned the founding of the Smithsonian Institution and the uh, rules and regulations for what gifts can an American president accept from a foreign a head of state. Uh, this had never been the case before, uh, but they were, they were contributed uh, to the repository of gifts uh, granted the United States by people from other countries. Uh, fast forward uh, to the tw 20th century, <clears throat> the Soviet Union in uh, uh, December of 1979 uh, invaded uh, Afghanistan. And a chapter uh, in that invasion and 
the like uh, was partially closed this past August uh, when the United States uh, uh, working with uh, Oman and Qatar in particular was able to evacuate more than 120,000 people from Afghanistan before the Taliban uh, entered uh, Kabul uh, to assume the reins of, of government uh, there. When that happened, uh, Oman was the closest Arab country to that invasion and occupation. And then US President Jimmy Carter, looking for a friend and ally, strategic partner, uh, reached out to Oman and Oman uh, uh, responded in a resonant manner, timely and urgent and relevant uh, to be a partner with the United States to deter the Soviet Union from advancing further and to try to do what was possible to defend the Afghan people whose national sovereignty, political independence, and territorial integrity had been trampled uh, underfoot. Uh, from there, uh, Oman's role in the shadows, uh, helping to rescue Americans who had been stranded and some who had been uh, kidnapped. Uh, Oman uh, is distinct and not seeking credit for many of its international achievements. It prefers to work away from the headlights, away from the press conferences, away from summits uh, per se. Uh, but uh, Oman was instrumental in the formation of the Gulf Cooperation Council. I was privileged to be present as an observer in the last meeting in Muscat uh, in uh, April of 1981 uh, before the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council of uh, Kuwait, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, and Oman uh, was announced uh, to the public. And privileged as well to be the guest of His Majesty at each of the summits hosted by Oman, as well as the guest of all of the other heads of state in the ministerial mm -hmm. council uh, since 1981. It's a privilege, uh, a badge of honor, and a, a recognition of the importance of the GCC uh, to the world and to the United States in particular. Why the United States? Because the United States is the dominant uh, defensive power with defense cooperation agreements, not only with Oman dating from uh, 1980 when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, but straight through to the, to the present. Many people think that the uh, imports and exports uh, into the uh, area of Arabia and the Gulf and the exports out uh, go through Iran's territorial waters. Nothing could be further from the truth. No, they go through Oman's territorial waters. It's about 21 to 22 miles across the Hormuz Strait from Oman's side on the southern side or the western side of the Gulf to Iran on the eastern side or the northern side of the uh, Gulf. Uh, but there are three lanes, two uh, lanes uh, have to do with exports and imports. One is two miles wide coming in, another is two miles wide going out, and another is two miles wide in, the two, in between the two as a, as a buffer zone and safety. From that point uh, forward in 1979 uh, was my second and last uh, uh, close meeting with His Majesty, the late uh, Majesty Sultan uh, Qaboos bin Said uh, Al uh, Said. Uh, we first met in January of 1975. Uh, we met again uh, when he came to the United States, and we met at the Blair House, the official guest house for foreign visitors. We we also uh, had a breakfast. We had a dinner together, and then in 1983, uh, he invited me to join him with President Reagan at the White House uh, for dinner. That was his last official visit to, to the United States. And of course, I've seen him at the summits where he's presided or been a major participant uh, since the first summit uh, occurred. In 1998, on October the 15th, His Majesty received the first ever International Peace Award. No other Arab head of state has received such an award but 33 organizations stood with the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations, Harvard University, the Air Force Academy, the Kennedy Center, and 30 others uh, to give credit where credit was due with uh, President Carter presenting the award 
I was privileged to moderate and His Excellency Yusuf bin Alawi Al Abdullah, the minister responsible for foreign affairs, receiving it on behalf of His Majesty. Now that, that is just a, a superficial impressionistic brushstroke of the uniqueness, distinctness of Oban, where the magazine Conde Nast uh, indicated several years ago that if one did not um, put on the list a visit to Oman, then one would be missing something in her or, or his uh, life. Uh, the American connection with Oman has gone on not just since the late 18th century, but uh, throughout the uh, 20th century, when I first went to Oman, I lived, there were no, at the beginning, uh, motels, hotels, guest houses, uh, and the like. I lived uh, in a hospital uh, with 48 lepers that the Arabian mission of the Dutch Reformed Church of America had taken under, under that care. So uh, we provided some of the earliest Western trained and educated nurses, educators, and doctors. Uh, this is part of the people to people dynamic that is the glue, is the lubricant, is the cement that keeps our two peoples and cultures and countries uh, together. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Musa bin Hamdan Musa Al Tai. He's the ambassador of Oman to the United States, now just beginning the second year of his being uh, posted here. Previously, he was ambassador to, to Korea. Uh, he was the head of the Office of Strategic Cooperation in uh, Oman's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and non-resident ambassador to several West African countries, including Mali and Mauritania. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anthony. Good morning or good evening to everybody. Assalamu alaikum. I am very pleased to present a short, short opening remarks today on, on the event destination, Oman Heritage Culture Adventure. Dr. John Duke Anthony and the National Council on US-Arab Relations have been good friends of our region and Oman in particular, playing an important role of bringing the, our people together, highlighting our common interest. We have just had uh, a culture event of our own at the Sultan Kabus Culture Center here in Washington. Over three events, uh, press forum, we had poetry and music that was played by American and Omani artists. And uh, on the side of that event, we also had a, a photo exhibition that presented some of the diverse beauty of Oman we are very happy to share that, share that exhibition again in the near future. I invite everybody of your uh, followers to visit the Sultan Qaboos Culture Center if they are near DC or explore it online. Today we will focus on the economy, especially after your uh, introduction of the historical relation between Oman and the United States. Uh, I can shorten my uh, remarks a little bit more. Uh, Oman now, in terms of its economy, is implementing a development plan aimed at diversifying our economy and supporting a thriving non-oil-based private sector. It's called Vision 2040. And its main priority sectors are manufacturing with uh, real with industrial states and knowledge oasis that focuses on ICT. Logistics, as you mentioned uh, historically, our major seaports, new airports, and world class, uh, uh, you know, uh, industrial states. Mining, you know, with uh, so many natural resources such as copper, chromite, silver, and some rare minerals. Fisheries, you know, having, you know, uh, enjoying a, a long coastline and three different seas with diverse fisheries. Renewable energy also, uh, which is very, very important in our plan as Oman has made significant investment and advancement towards addressing climate change. We have solar and 
wind power among among these and uh, Oman is maybe one of very few country, probably number two or three, with a combination of both solar and wind energy. Tourism, the subject of today, Oman has wealth and diverse attractions with coastline, beaches, mountains, desert, wildlife, uh, to name a few. In general, for the economy, we do enjoy a free trade agreement with the United States. The goal is to work together to increase trade and promote investment and business for Oman and the US. Oman is an excellent destination that offers a fantastic environment for business to prosper. It has all the ingredients to be a highly competitive destination for many leading businesses. I'll just highlight a few of our uh, tourism uh, attractions. Uh, first and foremost, Oman is one of the fastest and most secure countries and has been for long recommended by highly reputable uh, magazines and organizations that focus on tourism. It has attractions such as a total of five UNESCO World Heritage Sites, some environmental, you know, specialty, especially on the coastline, the green tilters that migrate to Oman, many beaches every year. Oman Air, our national flight, but other major airlines where it make it easy to visit Oman. Many hotels, resorts, camps, and retreats that suit every uh, tourist. The diverse geography and varied climate conditions between South, such as Salale, which is like very conveniently uh, not warm or not hot in the summer uh, with the monsoon, seasonal monsoon that makes it green and very, very com comfortable and very attracts so many uh, uh, tourists from the, especially from the region in the summer. The mountains, which constitute large pertences of the environment in Oman, such as Jebel Shems and Jebel Akhdar. Jebel Shems is the highest peak uh, in the Arab Peninsula. It's, uh, it's about 3,000 uh, meters or 10,000 feet height. Many caves in Oman, varying in types and length and size in, and their geographic formation and attract a large number of adventurers to Oman. Geological sites such as rock gardens, uh, and other, you know, that very, very much coming into place now for this. The desert is very popular in Oman. It is an extension of the Bedouin lifestyle with its ancient association of traditional culture and authentic regional customs. This is in a brief, as you stated earlier, I, I really enjoy these uh, tourist attractions because spending a long time myself abroad, I always go back with my family and enjoy Oman as a tourist. <laughs> and I am surprised how much I discover every year. I leave it at this and look forward to follow the rest of the event. Thank you very much, Dr. Anthony. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. <clears throat> And it says uh, uh, mountains in volumes <clears throat> that an individual who's born and raised in her or his country and goes abroad can look forward to returning with such longing and love as you and your family have uh, for Oman. And that you can also see it uh, through the eyes of a tourist. Uh, I've lived here in Washington, DC now for 59 uh, years. And uh, there's never been a boring half hour so uh, we're both blessed to live in fascinating places in Oman, unlike uh, many other countries with its mountains and valleys and rivers and trees, green things, growing things, the desert, uh, its challenges with water and wind and uh, especially a turn uh, for sensitivity to the environment. Um, we're both fortunate, Mr. Ambassador. We'll switch now to uh, Professor Linda Funch uh, Linda Funch is a, an alumna of the National Council's Malone Faculty Arab and Islamic Studies program. She first went to Oman in 1974 
when she was based in New York with the Ford Foundation and was editor of the Arab World. That was the name of the magazine, much like Reader's Digest uh, in its length and its uh, focus on uh, culture and, and other uh, countries, societies that were little known and even less well appreciated uh, by the English language uh, uh, readers. Uh, she uh, ob obtained her master's in Near East Studies from New York University in New York and also uh, at the Center for Arab Studies abroad at the American uh, University in Cairo. Uh, she's a member of the National Council's International Advisory uh, Board and is now seven years on after the publication of a magnificent book, Oman Reborn, uh, having uh, to do uh, with uh, balancing tradition and uh, modernization and the Sultanate of Oman. And that book has been translated into Arabic. She's been much feted in Oman for a path-breaking uh, book uh, that has heavily emphasized uh, the dynamic role, little appreciated, less well known, of women in the development, in the national development process of the Sultanate of Oman. Linda Punch. Thank you very much, Dr. John Duke Anthony, for your invitation to speak today and for your most generous introduction. I am deeply honored to share this platform with His Excellency Ambassador Musa Hamdoun Ta'i and to have the opportunity to say a few words about a country that I have come to know well over the course of several decades. With the support of the National Council on U.S.-Arab Relations, I have been privileged to escort many delegations of U.S. military officers, educators, and laymen to Oman on cultural immersion study visits. It is my hope that my comments today, combined with the stunning visuals that will be presented by my good friend, Badr al Yazidi, would entice our viewers to experience for themselves the many wonders that await in Oman, the jewel of the Middle East. The Sultanate of Oman is a little known, but vitally important country of the Arab Middle East. It is the oldest independent country in the region. In many ways, Oman stands out as a good news story of the Middle East, easily defying stereotypes and in exciting visitors with its rich history, cultural authenticity, and modern amenities. The story of Oman is compelling. While it is located in Arabia, a landmass most popularly associated with deserts and nomadic lifestyles, Oman's long history is that of a seafaring power with a long tradition of globalization and interaction with a variety of cultures. For Omanis throughout the ages, the sea has truly been their window to the world. In antiquity, the Sultanate served as a vibrant international hub for trade, exporting large quantities of copper and frankincense all over the world. In the 19th century, the Omani Empire, with its headquarters in Zanzibar, had a formidable fleet of ships that plied the seas, trading with merchants from all corners of the world, both Eastern and Western hemispheres. The Omani Sultan at the time, Said bin Sultan enjoyed the cooperation and respect of leaders from major powers, including the United States and England. To a considerable extent, Oman's history of maritime commerce and interaction with peoples from all corners of the world has shaped the worldview of its people, whose acceptance of others and hospitality towards strangers is legendary. Similarly, prolonged interaction with diverse cultures throughout the centuries has shaped Oman's unique assessment of its role in the world. Its foreign policy places a premium on peace, dialogue, and non-interference in the domestic affairs of other nations. Friend to all, enemy to none, Oman offers a compelling example of an independent, 
forward-looking nation whose modern foreign policy is a product of its history, its values, and a realistic appraisal of 21st century geopolitics. As Dr. Anthony has already stated, the Sultan's unbroken friendship with the United States dating from the era of President George Washington is unparalleled among its neighbors in the Middle East. In 1840, the first Arab ambassador arrived in the United States, Ahmed bin Naman. He arrived in New York City amidst great fanfare and jubilation to celebrate the Treaty of Friendship. Before the turn of the 20th century, American missionaries established schools and health centers throughout Oman, serving the people of that country selflessly for decades, often under the most difficult conditions, well into the 1970s. Oman's friendly bi bi bilateral relations with the United States have continued to this day. In the economic sphere, as has been pointed out, Oman enjoys a free trade agreement with the United States, one of only 15 countries in the world to claim this special relationship. As a result of a series of historical and economic setbacks, by the mid 20th century, Oman, once a world power with an empire that reached from South Asia to Arabia and along the East Coast of Africa, had descended into an impoverished, isolated, and virtually unknown terra incognita. In 1970, a new dawn arose over this enchanting land as His Majesty, the late Qaboos bin Said, became the Sultan of Oman. Sultan Said, Sultan Qaboos, whose reign spanned five decades, ushered in an unprecedented era of modernization and development, uniting his countrymen while introducing peace and prosperity to the Sultanate. Upon ascending the throne, his challenges were formidable. Lesser men might surely have fled. Armed with a sweeping vision and desisted by oil revenues, Sultan Qaboos presided over an era known as the Omani Renaissance a program of culturally authentic modernization. Education and healthcare emerged as the twin engines of Oman's development efforts. Women were encouraged to participate to the fullest extent in building a modern state where institutions would guarantee equality, rule of law and gender blind opportunities. Indeed, the progress that has been achieved by the people of Oman, led first by Sultan Qaboos and now by his successor, Sultan Haitham bin Tariq, has been extraordinary. But what can an unsuspecting visitor expect when he or she first sets foot in the Sultanate of Oman? Upon arriving in the capital city, Muscat, one seasoned traveler, writing for a major travel magazine, listened as her Omani driver exclaimed, when you put a foot in Oman, you are going to be happy. Discounting the statement as mere hyperbole, a sign of perhaps patriotic exuberance, the author, after a few days in the Sultanate, was forced to concede that this assessment was in fact not far from the mark. Omani society is a mosaic of racial, linguistic, and religious traditions that coalesce as if seamlessly <clears throat> into a relatively cohesive national body. Tolerance of all religious traditions is part of the Omani national fabric. While most Omanis identify with one of three Islamic traditions, Sectarian divisions, such as those that have devastated countless other societies of the Middle East and elsewhere, do not exist. Christian churches and Hindu temples coexist as part of the cultural mosaic that is Oman. 
The people of Oman have embraced modernization while holding tight to cherished customs and traditions. Omanis, both men and women, at every level of society, wear their national dress with pride. They are at ease with themselves and comfortable with their identity. Omanis are kind, self-effacing, and generous. Their hospitality is legendary. Given their history of cosmopolitanism, they are genuinely interested in learning about peoples and cultures from all corners of the world. They are polite and understated in a way that puts visitors immediately at ease. In my experience, a certain serenity pervades this special place. Diversity is everywhere apparent in Oman, not only among its people, but also in its land. The Sultanate boasts a landscape that is as dramatic as it is varied. With 1,100 miles of coastline, the Sultanate of Oman is home to pristine stretches of white sandy beaches, dramatic fjords, and a vast array of colorful birds, sea creatures, and exotic wildlife. Sailing in a historic dhow among the inlets of the renowned Strait of Hormuz in Oman's northern reaches delights visitors as they spy playful dolphins, historic islands, and remote villages nestled deep within the crevices of the mountains. Endless stretches of desert, including the eastern entrance, entrance to the famous Rub al-Khali, or empty quarter, form vast mountains of undulating reddish-brown sand, whose breathtaking contours and burnt colors assume different shapes and hues throughout the day, navigating the massive sand dunes at dusk, by camel, of course, to witness the sun gently sinking into the endless horizon is an experience not soon forgotten. Throughout the north and south of Oman, a series of impressive rocky mountain ranges boasting deep canyons, endless caves, and majestic pe peaks rising as much as 10,000 feet above sea level and often covered with snow in the winter <clears throat> defy the average armchair traveler's image of Arabia. Today, these imposing formations are accessible by way of an intricate system of roads and highways new within the last 50 years of Oman's unprecedented development. As I prepare to turn the program over to my friend and fellow traveler, Badr al Yazidi, I invite everyone to visit Oman. Within the next few months, Badr and I plan to escort another small group of adventurers to the Sultanate on a learning on location cultural immersion experience. As we emerge from our COVID-induced isolation, we invite you to join us as we explore the Sultanate, a country that was described by the late celebrity chef, author, and travel documentarian, Anthony Bourdain, in the following terms. Oman, he said, defies expectations. According to the cruel logic of the world, it shouldn't exist, but it does. It's incredible. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Linda, <clears throat> for that very uh, eloquent uh, introduction and overview of aspects of Oman's multifaceted dynamics. That can only come from the head and the heart and <clears throat> from someone such as yourself, who's visited the Sultanate uh, more than two dozen times. And yes, uh, we're proud to have you as an alumna of that uh, programs to Oman and to serve as, a, as an escort for delegations that we have organized and recruited and administered regarding uh, the Sultanate. And uh, to see you do the same thing as other alumni of uh, programs in Oman. So uh, with that um, segue, uh, to Bader al-Yazidi. Bader al-Yazidi is the head of Panorama Tours 
an award-winning institution for tourism in Oman. And mind you, that tourism in Oman is, is less than half a century old, uh, less than uh, 40, uh, four decades old. I remember <laughs> speaking with the first minister of tourism, uh, who was very reluctant and uh, wondered what he'd done wrong to be assigned that particular responsibility. And when he was asked, well, what kind of tourism do you envision, uh, Your Excellency? And he said, merciful tourism, please by which he meant no um, uh, rings in the nose and the uh, ear, earlobes and no barefoot and no strumming guitars uh, roaming around uh, the, the country. I remember being there when the first tourist came and I believe the youngest one was about 85. Uh, these were women from Switzerland and Austria and <laughs> they were world travelers. Uh, they, were, they were safe, they were merciful. Uh, there, but uh, look what has happened since then. Anthony Bourdain's uh, statement of what a ringing endorsement and imprimatur of acceptance and recognition and praise and, and award and reward. Uh, Bar El Yazidi uh, has won one of Oman's tourism awards in 2019. He's uh, a member of the faculty at Sultan Qaboos University which has an entire section devoted to uh, developing and administering and organizing tourism uh, to the Sultanate. And he is the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations first uh, International Cultural Affairs Fellow. Join me please in welcoming Bara El Yazidi. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Anthony for the uh, introduction and thank you for the National Council for for organizing this session about Oman today and thanks to His Excellency the Ambassador of Oman in Washington to join us today. It was a little bit uh, challenging actually to to put those pictures together uh, because of the diversity of the country, the number of the attractions, but I tried my best to simulate them with the visits of the National Council. So I got about like 70 uh, slides uh, in which some of them are actually videos from various places uh, in Oman and uh, villages and towns as well. Uh, it's a large file, so uh, sometimes it's my jammed back and uh, you will excuse me, excuse me for seconds. Uh, to go back and start it again if it jammed back, but uh, just to save the time and cover them all, yeah. um, I, will, I will go through them as fast as I can, starting with the first slide here, which is a fact sheet about uh, the Sultanate. So the Sultanate actually located in the southern, in the southeastern of the Arabian Peninsula. So it's the, it's get the first sunlight in Arabia because it's the most eastern, eastern part of the Arabian world. And it's very low in terms of population. It's 4.5 million. Uh, they live in a huge land, which is 3,900 kilometers square. That's almost the size of Italy or Great Britain. The main revenue of the country is, of course, oil and gas, uh, along with manufacturing, logistics, mining, tourism, which is promising now and fisheries, the Omani flag, and uh, the national emblem, which is the two cross swords, and the silver dagger that's worn by the gentlemen in official occasions. So most of those slides that we are gonna see, they would be from various towns, started with Muscat, which is the capital province of Oman, and Salala in the south, which is the second town, and it's the capital of the southern province of Bufar, uh, Nizwa, which is the ancient capital of Oman, uh, Sur, the maritime town of, uh, of Oman, and, and Mesendam in the top at the Strait of Hormuz, uh, and the empty quarter, which is the largest continuous sea sand in the world. So starting with Muscat, uh, province, which is the capital province. 
Uh, it contains six towns and it's spread for about 100 kilometers either side. From the picture, you could view the, the, the town and the regulation of the Muscat municipality to preserve the town in, into what you are looking at. So limits for heights and there is regulations for colors, regulations for designs, as well as the construction in Muscat is actually fill the wadis and the canyons with wherever the mountains allowed as you are toward this area, which is close from the old town of Muscat. So limited spaces because the mountains get closer from the sea, but toward the airport, you get more spaces as the mountains goes a little bit away from the, from the ocean. Uh, the picture in here is for the old town of Muscat. Uh, so the balas is the building or the official balas is the building with the blue and golden columns. And the flag is flying means the Sultan is actually in the province of Muscat. If he would be traveling out of Muscat province, the flag will be down. Behind the balas, it's actually protected water. And that is the famous port of Muscat, which is fully fortified as you see uh, with the fortification, uh, this fortification being rebuilt in the early 1500s by the Portuguese when they have captured Muscat. Uh, the fort to the left is Al Mirani, which is still used by the Royal Guards. So the Royal Guards who are actually doing all their work in the palace, they are actually living on that fort. Below it, it's an old building with flags on them, so they are official buildings. But those buildings are dated back for more than 150 years, but they are still renovated and used as an offices for the government, for the royal court and their royal uh, affairs. Uh, yeah, here's another view of the balas from uh, the back. Uh, actually, the picture, it was one of the delegation of the National Council when we were touring Muscat. So we went in a walk behind the balas to view the famous port of Muscat. During the visits in Muscat for the National Council, they meet with the uh, uh, government officials. So the picture is after a meeting with His Excellency uh, Abdelaziz Rawas, uh, the, the bribes advisor for the Sultan for Culture Affairs. Matrah is the sister town of Muscat and uh, probably just like one decade ago, this port was like the biggest port in the country, not anymore. There is three more built and these port have been converted totally into a cruise terminal. So the picture had been snapped from the fort of Matrah, which is also rebuilt by the Portuguese when they have captured Muscat uh, after they attacked the coast of Oman in 1507. Another view of Muscat, you could see the amazing contrast of Matrah, uh, of the blue, Sea of Oman, the old houses, which is some of them are dated back more than 150, 200 years old. They belong to merchants. Uh, some are new, but also the fortification from the 1600, the fort of Matrah just to the left of the picture. And that's where I snapped the previous picture from. Matrah is also famous with its souk, uh, which is one of the oldest souks in Arabia. Uh, which is famous for um, selling uh, frankincense, uh, uh, silver jewels, uh, clothing, uh, spices, and zaffron. But what is really amazing me in Matrah is that uh, mix of architect between uh, the Arab architect and uh, all the influence we would get from India and from Africa. So if you look into the lower right corner of the, of the slide, there is a minaret over there that it looks uh, for me more Indian and just to the left of it there is another minaret, a mosque minaret which is more Arab and everything it seems going really well in a nice harmony with that watchtower from the 1600 on the back. Here is more image of Matrah that it's probably described what I'm talking about of that mix of architect. So those houses which is called the verandas actually they were merchant houses so the families would be living on the second floor and the first floor would be would be used uh, as a stores for the, for the goods. And everything seems really goes nice together in a nice harmony, including the volcanic mountains on the back and the fortification from the 1600s. Uh, One of the main landmarks of Muscat is the Sultan Qaboos Grand Mosque is a building that's built to live for centuries actually, because literally they have used the best materials they ever could get in this planet Earth. 
So the sand stone, which is covered the walls from outside is from Rajasthan, India, marble from Italy, and they build a full factory in Iran to build the, or to make the carpet of the mosque and more than 600 person have worked for six months to sew it together as one piece. Here's the exterior of the mosque and the chandelier that you see in the middle of the picture, that is 8.9 ton. Uh, it has 1,122 1, lamp inside it. And to give you uh, an idea of how big it is, if one light went off, then they have a crane that would get through one of the maintenance doors and they would lift a man who would open a door and literally he would walk inside that chandelier to, to do all the work that is needed. Uh, the ceramic, which is around the dome, it's actually uh, re uh, reflect what is on the ground, which is the Persian carpet. So it's a Persian ceramic to go well with the carpet underneath it. But all the woodwork, which is around the minaret, that is uh, a decorated wood, which is represent the Armani uh, style in, in, in doing uh, or building the ceiling of the castles and the forts that they built on the 16th, 17th even in the 1800s. Uh, so the mosque is actually uh, has a mix of architects from all over the Islamic world. One of the landmarks in Muscat is the Royal Opera uh, House, which is the first opera house built in, a in the Gulf. Uh, it's a stunning building. Uh, uh, it could fit like 100, 1,100 person uh, for the performances. And to give you an idea of how unique this building is, the 40 ton stand can move backward and forward with a push of a button. So if they want it to be an opera and orchestra, they just push it a button and that's, that stand would move backward and forward. And if it's moved backward, more seats would rise up from the ground and they could also level the, the height of the, of the theater to have the best uh, quality of sound. The main way to travel within the country, not just only in Muscat and the main towns, is actually by roads. It does make sense because we have low population spread over a huge land. Uh, we still have three international airports in Salalah, Dukum, Muscat, as well as domestic airports in uh, Sohar and in, uh, in Mesendam. But very much uh, uh, traveling by car, it's the way to travel. But also it's very interesting because it goes it's take you through the different terrains in Oman. So my next slide, it would be for various driving around uh, the country because that obviously what most of the travelers when they travel in Oman, they would see. Uh, yeah, so the, the highway over here, it's actually the highway that links Muscat to the interior to the ancient capital Nizwa. And it's run at the foothill of the Hajar mountain that's rising for uh, about 2000 meter and the highest peak is 3000 uh, meters. So we have an excellent road network everywhere you go around the country, not just in the capital of Muscat. Uh, another amazing coastal uh, highway, which is linking Muscat to Sur. Uh, and this time, this coastal road, it actually goes over some of the stunning wadis that's been visited by Marco Bolo and Ibn Battuta. And in the next slides, uh, we are going to see some of those wadis or valleys. One of the most beautiful uh, scenic roads that I like, honestly, is the one west of the Dufar range of mountain uh, because of the topography of those mountains as well as uh, because of the greenery on that uh, area. Uh, in here, it shows uh, another road that goes up to Jabal Akhbar, so from 400 meter into 2000 meters. It's give you an idea of how much really money the government is spending in this excellent network. Uh, it looks dry, but if it would rain, you would have flash floods that flow down to the desert. So they have to really spend a huge amount of money in building these uh, excellent networks, enforcing it with the cement, as well as to rise it above those, uh, those, uh, those uh, wadis or floods. So excellent road network wherever you go around the country. Uh, 
This one, it goes through one of the wadis uh, in the Hajar mountain, but the very interesting thing on this picture actually, it's the 1.5 kilometer height of this mountain, which is sediments from the bottom of the wadi all the way to the top of the mountains. So that's a million of years record of the geological history of the earth. The Hajar mountains in Oman are considered as one of the world's most beautiful geological museums. A person could spend the rest of his life traveling around the earth to see all those geological features, while in Oman you could see them in one place uh, in the Hajar mountains. Uh, in addition that those rocks in Oman are exposed, they don't have any green cover uh, on them. While close from 80% from the country is actually covered with sand, so driving in sand trucks when you are visiting the Sharqiya sands or the empty water is a must. Uh, and amazing graded roads, whether in the Hajar mountain in the north or the Dufar range south. Uh, the vertical cliffs on those mountains here are actually the, the last home for the endangered Arabian libid. We still have more than 200 animals are living on those, uh, on those mountains over here. Niswa, it's the ancient capital before Masqat, uh, the picture actually for the old center of Niswa. So the circular tower is the fort of Niswa, which is built at the late of the 1600. Behind it will be the castle, the Grand Mosque in Niswa, which is not anymore because they built a mosque bigger than this one, just somewhere outside from the center of Niswa. And then you have the city wall, which is actually connecting the souk, some of the housing area, and it link with the fort from the backside. Behind these uh, buildings is actually an oasis of Niswa, which is palm dates from the back of the mount of the fort all the way to the foothill of the of the volcanic rocks that you see in the picture. And this oasis is actually irrigated by a by a traditional uh, irrigation system, which is a unique to a man. Uh, which we call Falaj, and the Falaj that is used to irrigate the oasis of Niswa, it's actually a UNESCO Falaj, and the mountains that we are looking at on the back, these are what they would call the Ophiolite rocks, which has been lifted uh, by the collagen, the tectonic collagen between the uh, Indian Oceanic crust with the Arabian one, and that was subduction where the Arabian one, the Indian plate went below the Arabian one and lifting it up so that volcanic rocks is actually part from the earth mental being lifted up because of, because of that, uh, that uh, collision between the Arabian blade and the Indian, Indian blade. Um, Nidia, Nizwa is also famous for its souk, which is, has different departments. So this one is from the East Souk, which is, which is known for sailing the spices, uh, dates and syrup and farming equipment. Uh, as well, there is, will be a section for handicrafts, which is well known for uh, selling um, uh, jewels, silver jewels, uh, uh, silver daggers. And Niswa also, it's famous for uh, an auction in Friday for the animals, as you see in the upper, uh, in the, the left, the upper left side of the, of the, of the slide. Mm -hmm. So in Oman, we have more than 500 forts and castles across the country. Uh, the picture in here of me, uh, Patrick Monsino, the vice president of the National Council and Juma'a, one of our staff. After we visited the castle of Jibreel, which is to the left here, uh, or, or, the, or to the right, or to my right, this castle, it's one of the most beautiful castle in Oman. And actually it's built as a palace for the, for the, for the head of the state to stay in, in the past. Above it, it would be a range of a mountain. Above that will be another range of a mountain, and that is the highest peak in Oman, Jabal Shams, the 3,000 meter. The white in the, in the top of the mountains, that's clouds, but regularly in, uh, in winter time, we do have storms where it do snow above those, uh, those mountains. Here's the exterior of the, of the castle of Jibreen. Uh, this one is uh, what they would call the moon and sun rooms. So uh, they call it the moon and sun rooms because those windows that they make them just below the ceiling, they allow the light of the sun during the day and the light of the moon and the stars during the night. Just at the bottom of the ground, another, another, another windows to keep the air circulation, which is amazing. If you visit in summer here, 
you would be able to notice there is close from 15 degrees different in terms of temperature outside and inside uh, the castle, as well as the, the walls are thick, so they are isolated, but also they have secret uh, passages that would be used by the guards to provide more security, as well as they use them to serve food into, uh, into, into the guest when they visit in a room like this one here. Uh, the ceiling is well decorated from the 1700 and it's reflect what is on the ground, those Persian carpets. So those are the official rooms where the head of the state would meet, would, would meet officials. So it's an equivalent to the Oval Office in the White House, except, if, except it's from the 1700s. Another, another amazing fort, and this time it's Bahala UNESCO Fort, which is dated back to the pre-Islamic era. It's one of the biggest muddy buildings in the world. Uh, it's been rebuilt many times, uh, but Bahla, it's also famous. I don't know if you would be able to see me while I'm moving my cursor, but Bahla, it would have a wall. So I'm trying to run my cursor over that wall and it's run for a 14 kilometers and literally two men in some side of that wall could walk shoulder to shoulder in the top of that uh, of that wall. So it's provide more security to the fort, the oasis, the souk, and the people housing. To the right side of the fort, there is a square building because in the past, mosques in Oman, they won't have a, a minaret and they would have just like a flat ceiling. So that also is a restored mosque and still used for the Friday prayers. This slide over here, it's for the Grand Canyon, which is the twin brother of the U.S. Uh, Canyon, Grand Canyon, but the, the one in the state is, goes forever. Uh, the, can, the Grand Canyon in Oman, it's in about like four or five kilometers to the right of the image, but it's deeper. So uh, there is a drop just in front of that fence of like 1.5 kilometer. And if you are standing in the other side of the canyon, depend where you are standing, it would be more than that. And somewhere to the left there, it will be uh, the highest peak in Oman, which is Jebel Shams. In this uh, harsh environment of the Hajar mountain, which is spread for about 700 kilometers, separated the coast from Oman from the desert, the people lived in this harsh environment and they uh, lived in the mountains, cultivated uh, in agriculture terraces that they will build over here, like in Jebel Akhdar, because somewhere to the right here, there is a spring. So they would use that spring to, uh, to irrigate all of these gardens. And due to the altitude, uh, it's much more cooler than Niswa down here. So more than 15 degrees different. And that's allowing them to grow trees, which that is not native to the weather in the Gulf. Uh, Barmogranite, uh, roseberries, uh, Damascus roses, recently olives, uh, as well as uh, pears. Uh, the mountain or the Hajar mountains have stunning villages uh, all around either side, whether in the desert side or in the mount or in the seaside. Uh, this is one of the villages that I like because uh, it's located in this deep wadi, one kilometer's depth of those mountains behind it. The people lived here because behind the village there is a spring. It would flow to make a stream, and that stream would be used to water all of these gardens, which is look random for you in the picture, but from underneath the palm, it's well organized in terraces and it's owned by those individual people from the village here. So somewhere, somewhere in here, I could see there is a vehicle. So there is a road to this village. There is electricity billers. In the top, in the height up there, there would be a, a telephone area. So the students from this village is actually, they could attend their school online if they want. But there is a, there is a four by four, transportation from the school, from the government, for those students to go to the school. Actually, the government in Oman is providing transportation for students anywhere in the country, wherever you live in Oman. And therefore, there is no ability for students to do not go into school. So literally, the number of kids they don't go to school in Oman is, is zero. Here is another village that, uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, this is one of the villages that I really like from uh, as a photographer because each time I would pass here, it would has a different colors because it's depend on 
what time of the day I will be there, but also because what they grow on those terraces is change all the time. But one of the nice thing in this village, these students where they build their neighborhood, it was just right. So they were able to build those homes close from each other, stick the houses together, limited the number of entrances so they would have few entrances to God and that would provide security for the entire neighborhood. And they build their watchtower just right at the top to give more security to the neighborhood, as well as to give a security to the water source, which is right on the back of the foot, uh, right on the back of the neighborhood, there is a spring where the water would be channeled to irrigate all of those uh, gardens. So the Hajar Mountains also would have uh, wadis, which is valleys. Uh, these wadis are rich ecological systems. They would have pools of crystal water, as you see on the picture over here. This water would be channeled into the phalages again, and it would be used, as you see on the picture in here, to irrigate the palm dates uh, and the mango uh, gardens, as well as the uh, bananas and the guavas. Uh, and all the other trees that they would grow on the shade of those uh, palm dates. But what would happen uh, in areas where there isn't any water on the surface, like a spring or a water stream, uh, the people will actually drill in the, in, the, in the mountains or in the hills close from them uh, to get that water, which, uh, which is another type of fallage that they call it the Addi fallage or the counting fallage. So fallages are unique into Oman and some of them are dated back 4,000 years. We believe the first village being drilled in Oman, uh, 3,500 BC. And how that works is, if you would look into the lower section of the of the of the of the slide, uh, you would have a village over here and mountains or hills, uh, 20 kilometers or 30 kilometers. There is people actually who are well known for drilling those villages, and they are expert in doing it. So they would know that there is water over here. They would drill the first water well, which is they call it the mother of the village. It's give them all what they need from the information about the living in the underground. If it's higher from the village, that's mean if they drill horizontally, the water would flow in the, into the village. But they can't do that in one go because it's far away. It's 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers. So what they will do, as you see in the upper section, they would start to drill horizontally. And each time they have to build a water well. So these water wells will help them to clear, clear all the stuff. It would help them to breathe. It would help them on the future to, to maintain the village. But they have to be very careful because this slope, it has to be a gentle slope and the water should flow gradually to the village. So it won't weather the system on the future. And when the water reach the village, another system will be built and they would be the village master who's his job is actually to divide the shears of these fallage. And uh, the, uh, they would start to, they would invent a system to actually count the time. That's, they would call it the counting village. So they would be using, the, they would build stone uh, towers from stones over the mountains, and they would use that uh, to find the time when the Milky Way galaxy stars are moving from one, star, from one tower to hit the next one. And for the daytime, they would be using the, the shade of the sun as it's moving from the sunrise to the sunset to find, uh, to find the time. So about 3,000 palages in the country still used every day in watering the gardens in Oman, in which five villages are considered as UNESCO villages. There is no doubt that the uh, empty quarter desert uh, in Arabia, it's the largest continuous sea sand in the world. There is nothing like it enough there is only one other empty quarter in the solar system, and that is in Mars. Uh, the picture actually I took from for uh, uh, when we were traveling on the on the desert of Dafar, where the highest sandy dunes of the empty quarters are. Uh, yeah, if you would look into this slide here, uh, and you take panorama travel vehicle as a as a scale. Uh, uh, for that massive sandy dunes on the back. So that is the highest sandy dune in the world. So that is about 350 to 400 meters above, 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 above ground. In the deserts of Oman, they contain uh, desert camps or tourist camps, uh, which is varies from uh, 
from authentic ones into luxury ones, where travelers enjoy spending nights in the, in the desert surrounding with the golden sandy dunes, uh, watch stars at night. Uh, uh, literally, you could see uh, 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 satellites moving uh, almost after 11 o'clock when all the dust is, is settled down. That's how clear it will be in the desert because you are away from any light pollution. Uh, many activities, uh, when people travel in the desert, they do uh, visit families, Bedouin families, enjoy the Arabic coffee with them, or go camel riding. Uh, and we find it, it has most of the time the highest uh, uh, feedback from our travelers. Uh, camel races is very common in Arabia. Uh, in the deserts of Oman, they probably, uh, oh, for sure, they are, they are breeding the fastest camels. Uh, on the races. And if you want your adrenaline rush, you may go dune bashing. So that sandy dune was about 150 meters. It's very safe and really enjoyable when you do it with the experts. Misandam in the north of the country, it's another, uh, another different environment of, of a man. I believe the picture, I took it for Dr. Anthony during the delegation in 2016, we were visiting Misandam. Uh, the picture is for the, uh, uh, the fjord of Nejd and uh, Misandam, it's well known for those fjords. Some people, they call it the Norway of Arabia, except the fjords in here have different formation, uh, geological formation. Those ones in here, actually, because the tectonic movement in, uh, in here, it's really uh, uh, strong. So it's forced all these mountains down and the sea is rising up. So it's actually sinking wadis or sinking valleys rather than the one uh, formed by the melt of the ice in, in Norway. In these, uh, in, these, uh, in these fjords, there is villages. Uh, so people take their boats, they go to their villages and the government is providing electricity, water and schools in some of those villages, as well as there is uh, ambulance boats, there is helicopters that the government run in case of, uh, in case of emergency. In this harsh environment, the people have lived and uh, developed uh, a lot of techniques uh, to help them to live in this harsh environment. Like in the mountains here, uh, some people are, are, are hunting rain and they use that rain to do some agriculture that provide a bit of food uh, security for them and for their, for their animals. The picture in here is for the fjord of Sham during the uh, sea trip in the traditional Dao. It's amazing uh, to see that scenery of the of the of the mountains with the change of light from the morning to the to the evening time. So during one of the delegations in Mesendam, we went visiting Kumzar. It's the northmost village in Oman, right at the Strait of Hormuz, and it's only accessible by sea by boat. And while we were just touring on the beach, we find those uh, young kids and. We, the, the group were interesting for them because they speak English, so they weren't practicing their English on them, uh, which allowed me to take this nice picture. Uh, behind me, it will be the water of the strait, and 35 kilometers across the strait, it would be Kashem Island, and that is the uh, Republic Islamic of Iran. This village, it has a school, it has a small port, it has a, it has a medical center, and it has also a branch for the municipality. Uh, Salala, or the south province of the far, it's again a totally different story, uh, a totally different ecosystem, not just from the rest of Oman, from the rest of Arabia. Because of the monsoon that's blew in Salala in summer for three months, it's uh, converted Salala into really a, a piece of uh, a heaven. So. Uh, a light rain that would fill the springs and the springs would flow to form waterfalls as you see in the picture over here. Uh, those, those men who are standing over there, they're giving you a scale of how high is that 
waterfall is. And actually, I snapped this picture last year when I went uh, down to Salala to climb down. If you look my, to my cursor, we were climbing down the waterfall, rock climbing from up there all the way uh, down. The picture here is for the famous Wadi Darbat right after the, 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 the monsoon when the clouds started to lift uh, over. And you could see the amount of greenery, the flowers, and the water that's flowed into the wadi. Uh, just right after the monsoon, the people would start to grease their animals back into those springs and into those wadis. Because during the monsoon, literally you can't see, and their animals can't see when they are herding them here. So they move them down closer from the sea. But then when the clouds lifted, they would start to bring them back. And that is a big tradition now in Salala, which is reconnecting all of those families and tribes with their traditions. And uh, normally I'm, I'm, I'm tuning myself to go into Salala just right on that time. So last time when I was there, I recorded this little video uh, when they were moving the camels uh, into Wadi Darbat. With the, with the number of camels, it seems like the camels are concurring earth while we were quarantining for two years because of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> And, and that sound wasn't Tarazan, that was a baby camel lost his mother because of the number of camels. And, and eventually all those babies, they would find their camels, at the, their mothers at the end. The far also it's famous for the UNESCO frankincense landsites. Uh, I believe here it's dated back for a thousand BC. It's a huge site. Uh, it's been described by Ibn Battuta, the famous Arabic explorer. Uh, the picture actually for the big mosque, which has got 144 uh, uh, columns, but the town was so huge. Uh, it was so huge because the frankincense that they used to trade with uh, was very valuable. Um, actually, the Nabatis uh, who built Medayan Saleh in Saudi and they built the Batra in Jordan, uh, one of the things that's drive that wealth to them, it was the frankincense that's come to them from here. And that was actually uh, one of the things that helped the Omanis to, to have an early contact with the ancient civilization, uh, the Pharaohs, Mesopotamia, the Indus Valley, and as far as, uh, as to uh, China. So the next slides will be about hotels in Oman, the picture. Uh, we have a world-class hotels uh, all over the country, whether in the mountains or in the beaches, whether in Misendam, Salala, and even in Muscat. The picture is for the Crown Plaza Salala, which mainly we, we, we use for the delegation of the National Council when we travel down to Salala. It's located in an amazing beach, which has been elected by uh, Condon, Condon Nest Travel Magazine recently as one of the most beautiful beaches in the world. Uh, those, uh, uh, um, coconuts over here actually uh, are native to Salala. They grow two types of coconuts because Salala has a totally different weather uh, uh, compared with the rest of the of the of the Gulf because of the monsoon. Uh, Anantara, another five-star property that is located at uh, the cliff of two thousand meter above the sea level, and actually it's overlooking a canyon, a main canyon in the in the in Jebel Akhdar, and it's overlooking the Terraces, the ancient terraces that we saw in the earlier in the earlier slides. Albastan Palace Hotel, the Ritz Carlton, which is the leading hotel in Oman, uh, located just in Albastan, nearby from Muscat in Albastan Village, and it has one kilometer private beach. Sur, it's the maritime town of, of Oman. This fortification actually to protect the port of Sur. The lighthouse is to direct the ships into the port, into the lagoon, which, which is used as a port. In Sur, uh, they still build boats like the one you see in the picture. And actually one of the, one of the owners of the Dow's uh, yards in Sur is building uh, the largest uh, Dow ever. And he is, uh, he is looking forward to get his project uh, registered in Guinness. Um, almost, almost, almost like, 50% done of that, of that, of that boat. This one, it's the last big, biggest Dow built in Sur, and now it's preserved in the museum of the Dows in Sur, the Maritime Museum. But when it's built in the 50s, it was served in the Gulf ports from Basra 
uh, to many of the Gulf ports, to Muscat, India, and the East African boats. It could carry about uh, uh, 300 uh, ton. Uh, uh, so my next slide, it will be for some uh, of the amazing trips that the people from Amman did in the past and even just recently. Uh, to show you that communication with all those nations. The paint in here, it's for uh, an African-American artist uh, for the arrival of the Amani merchant in China in the eighth century. Uh, the emperor uh, was so impressed with the integrity of those uh, merchants. And actually he chose one of them to be a general governor of all the expats who are allowed to trade with his, uh, with his empire, mainly to, in, in, in the port of Canton in Guangzhou uh, province. That is telling us of how much the, the Oman uh, trading with, with China was really important uh, from that uh, time. Another uh, amazing trip, and this time it's to New York in uh, 1840, uh, when the first Omani ambassador arrived into into, into New York, Ahmed bin Nurman uh, al kabi Again, the paint is for the same uh, African-American artist. Recently, there were uh, an Omani initiative project to reconnect Oman with its maritime heritage. So they built a boat uh, using the same techniques they would use thousands of years ago by sewing the woods together. It was a gift from the Sultan to the people from Singapore. Uh, it's follow an ancient trading path it was then the longest trading, sea trading path in the world. And uh, it sailed to, uh, in stages, uh, but uh, using the stars to find the locations as the Arabs would use in the past. So my next uh, little video, it would be about the jewel uh, of Muscat. In the Java Sea, south of Singapore, divers made an incredible discovery. A shipwreck laden with treasure. 60,000 pieces of porcelain, silver and gold. The treasure was around 1,200 years old. It turned out to be Chinese. But the origin of the ship remained a mystery. Then divers found a clue, evidence that the wreck's hull timbers were not nailed together, but sewn. The wreck gave archaeologists a unique glimpse of how the Arab sailors of legend might have designed and built ocean-going boats. These Arab navigators were really the pioneers in establishing what was then the longest sea trading route in the world. The wreck gave birth to a bold plan to reconstruct the boat using original methods and materials, then to follow the ancient trade routes five and a half thousand kilometers across the Indian Ocean to Singapore. Named Jewel of Muscat, the project is part of an Omani government initiative to help reconnect the country with its maritime heritage. On a beach just south of Muscat, the capital, an archaeological team is putting the finishing touches to an ocean-going Arab ship. Based on a 1,200-year-old design, it's 18 meters long, six and a half meters across, and weighs in at more than 18 tons. Amazingly, not one nail, screw, or bolt has been used in its construction. Instead, the boat is held together entirely by rope. The ship is a gift from the Sultan to the people of Singapore. Speeches are made, gifts exchanged. Time to go. No one has sailed a ship like this for centuries. The jewel of Muscat will follow the ancient trade routes traveled by Arab seafarers over a thousand years ago.
thousands of years, sailors look to the stars for directions. A solitary boat, a mighty sea, an epic voyage into the teeth of the storm. The jewel of Muscat is recreating a 1200 year old crossing. Its journey, a recipe for adventure. And then the words they have waited five months to hear. Welcome to Singapore, sir. She's to become the centerpiece of a permanent exhibition on Arab seafaring in Singapore. The only ship of its kind afloat. A triumph of archaeology in action. At last, the crew can celebrate. The president of Singapore accepts the Sultan's gift. So, trips from the beginning of time to everywhere that they could get into with their boats. Uh, these trips have shaped the Armani nationality to what we know it now. And it's probably explained the Armani uh, achieve for the good relation with others, not interfere in the other uh, affairs and call for peace always. Uh, in these principles have been inherited by Sultan Qaboos, the late Sultan Qaboos for 50 years during uh, his rule and uh, enhance them as well as for the Oman foreign uh, policy. In the picture, it's His Excellency Yusuf bin Alawi, the previous uh, minister of responsible of foreign affairs is receiving the International Peace uh, Award from President Carter in behalf of Sultan Qaboos and into the right lower side of the picture is uh, Dr. John Duke, uh, Anthony next to President uh, Carter during the ceremony. Also in 2020, the Indian government presented Gandhi Bees, uh, be surprised for the late Sultan Qaboos recognizing 50 years uh, of his remarkable work in maintaining the international security and inter in the international uh, bees. These principles would continue uh, from the first speech, uh, his ex uh, His Majesty Sultan Haytham bin Tariq, after he sworn a Sultan of Oman uh, in 10th of January 2020, uh, he confirmed that Oman would continue following the, the same path. Uh, our friends, the Americans, also they were they were great travelers too. Uh, actually, they made the most incredible journey throughout the human history of exploration to put a person in uh, in. Uh, in the moon. Um, in the next two slides, I tried to simulate uh, or uh, compare some of the alien toward nature that you would see when you're traveling to a man with the similar natures from the moon and from Mars. So here is a, a comparison between a short or a screenshot that I took for from Google Earth for the highest sanded dunes on the Earth compared with the with the picture released by NASA for the empty quarter in Mars, and they are looks really identical. Those pictures are not in the moon, they weren't in Mars, but they were in the far desert just a few years ago when the European Space Agency were uh, doing a simulation for the life in Mars. But honestly, Oman, it has much more to offer from the diverse nature, the culture, the heritage, and uh, the nature that looks like an alien world, uh, Oman truly could provide uh, that Arabian experience from a thousand and one stories. Uh, you will be charmed with the smell of the frankincense wherever you travel around the Sultanate and the aroma of, uh, of the Zafaran and the rose water in the, in the Omani dessert and the cardamom smell in the, in, the, in the Arabian coffee in every welcome. Uh, and you will be amazed uh, by that conservative balance between modernity and traditions that spans uh, over then 7,000 years ago. 
2022, hopefully it's gonna be the end of, uh, of the nightmare of COVID. Uh, we are almost seeing the, the end of the tunnel of this nightmare. So hopefully soon we will be all able to travel back again and explore our lovely planet Earth. I hope this, uh, this uh, virtual tour would put Oman at the top of your list uh, of exploration. If you would need any more information, you might visit our website, panorama.travel, or follow our social media accounts. Um, I hope this was informative and enjoyable. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Saeed Baru. <clears throat> uh, that was marvelous. And you can see why people <clears throat> who missed the first installment uh, last year uh, demanded, uh, requested, uh, and persuaded us to have a second go at this. <clears throat> and you've uh, taken it to a higher level uh, with uh, some of the uh, enduring constants, uh, but introducing some of the new features. Um, I would add to the latter <clears throat> the fact that there's been a historic breakthrough between uh, the Sultanate of Oman and Saudi Arabia. Uh, they have opened a road between the two countries now that did not exist before that will facilitate trade and um, commercial cooperation and investment uh, to a degree uh, not even imagined uh, before. And so <clears throat> it's true to a degree in many countries that geography is destiny. Uh, a country like Egypt, for example, was transformed when the um, Suez Canal was opened in 1869. <clears throat> in the Western Hemisphere, in the Caribbean, in the Pacific Ocean, likewise, when the Panama Canal was opened in the early uh, years of the 20th uh, century, and the Straits of Malacca en route to Malaysia, China, and Indonesia. Uh, and Oman's, though, has been constant. Uh, it has not had, on the maritime side, uh, to erect anything that was not already there. Uh, and this has to do with the uh, Homo Street, which is between the northwestern tip of Oman, which is similar to Alaska and the United States. That is to say, Canada comes in between the lower 48 American states and Alaska. Likewise with Oman, the pictures that he showed of the Musundum, it's separated by the United Arab Emirates. <clears throat> but that smaller piece of territory is not just vital to Oman. It's no exaggeration to say it's vital to all of humankind. Um, people may say what they wish about hydrocarbon fuels, oil and gas, um, but it will be years, certainly if not decades, uh, before uh, the world is weaned off of oil and gas uh, to wind and earth uh, temperatures and thermal currents and things of, of that nature, including electric cars and hydrogen as well. Uh, in the interim, Oman will continue to play a role that is vital <clears throat> to all of humanity's material well-being. And look at any country's uh, constitution and its basic laws, regardless of what they call it, uh, in terms of the four responsibilities of every country. One, to provide security for its people. Oman is at the top of the list of countries in the Eastern Arab region, the Middle East, and the Islamic world with regard to security, as Bada El Yazidi emphasized. And secondly, with regard to external defense so that others uh, who may be jealous, envious, and want to expand their territory at your expense, uh, but their gain. Uh, Oman has been well defended, primarily by a, a series of great power protectors. Uh, the Portuguese, uh, 500 years ago, then the Dutch, then the British, but increasingly in the last half century, the United States of America. So the bonds between the two of our countries and peoples on the defense cooperation side uh, would be the envy of many other countries, especially given uh, the situation the world is now in with regard to some of the rules-based order 
in the post-war period after World War II uh, are being violated with impunity. But not Oman. Oman stands firm uh, on the defense cooperation side. And then thirdly, the uh, administration of a civil system of justice. Uh, Oman uh, does not have political prisoners. Oman <clears throat> allows dissent. Oman has elections. Oman has women in its uh, consultative parliamentary uh, bodies and has had them for years <clears throat> at the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations. We were involved with Oman from the beginning as it tried to tell its story uh, to the United States. And many Americans uh, from a self-centric, rather arrogant, plus ignorant perspective, uh, judge other countries on the basis of which they have democratized their societies. Uh, but this is a word, a noun, that is overly associated with the United States of America whose policies towards the Arab region, the Middle East, and the Islamic world are hardly bereft of brimish, free from flaw or devoid of, of defect. Uh, but with Oman, one has a showcase of how a relationship between two like-minded peoples whose needs are aligned, whose concerns are aligned, whose interests are aligned, whose goals are aligned, have matched up uh, for now more than half of a century. And that fourth aspect in every country's founding structure, governmental laws and social political dynamics has to do with protecting and ideally advancing the material well-being of human beings. We're talking about schools, we're talking about water, talking about electricity, talking about sewage, we're talking about clean air. Oman has been at the forefront regionally and also globally as a pioneer, using what it has uh, to make progress on all four of these fronts, security, stability, justice, and material well-being. All four of these things are related together. And when you have them, you have peace. And when you have peace, you have prospects for prosperity. This is Oman, ladies and gentlemen. I invite you to visit it soon, inshallah, two weeks from now, will be my 54th visit to the Sultanate. And then inshallah, I'll return again in the summer for my 55th uh, visit. Uh, I've never grown tired, never had a boring, unadventurous visit to the country and spending time with its extraordinary people. Thank you for listening. Thank you for viewing. We look forward to our next webinar where we seek to pursue a mission, which is one word, namely education. Thank you.